Hey folks, Alcris here with a quick video about how city production works. I wanted to make this video to explain this fundamental and key concept that's critical to how you play Old World, and that's a little bit different than what you might have seen in other games, most notably Civilization. First and foremost, every city has three production queues. A growth production queue, a training production queue, and a civics production queue. So here we are in-game, and you can see there's three production queues. There's a growth production queue, a training production queue, and then a civics production queue that is split between specialists and projects. Now, while there are three queues, you can only build one of these queues at a time. So that means if I'm building a settler, I can't build a warrior at the same time. Instead, it queues it up. I have to pick. Each city can only build one thing, but there's three queues that effectively run in parallel, but only one of them can be running at any time. So what happens to the other two that aren't running? They go into an overflow. So if you're building a growth-based unit in a city, there is no overflow because every, all your growth production is being used to build that growth-based unit. But your, your city is still producing training and civics, and those go into the global training and civics pools. Back in game, if I select Settler here, you'll see that this city is now using 12 growth, its entire production, to create this Settler. It will take eight years to do so because it's building 12 growth a turn and it had four from the previous turn and then the civics production which is 10 is going into the global pool which is up here and then the training production which is also 10 is likewise going into the global pool here if i instead choose to build a warrior in this city you'll see that no training now goes into the global pool everything is going towards that warrior instead the growth now instead of going into the settler now goes into the citizen lot uh, for that city, which will lead to growth for that city. Uh, as, it, as the city grows, um, growth goes into citizens. Citizens are basically a bar the city fills up, and each citizen is this little green number right here. That tells you what a citizen is, how many citizens that city has available. And those are produced from the overflow of the growth production. In other words, if you only build settlers in a city, you will never get uh, citizens because all your growth is going into settlers and not into the overflow for growth, which is building citizens. So the growth-based units briefly are the ones available at the start of the game are settler, worker, scout, and militia. And later in game, you'll also have the conscript with higher tech, disciples, your religious disciples, caravans as well. Those are only buildable via growth. Uh, and that's those are the growth-based units. The training-based units are all your military units, and they will show up in this list here. And then let's talk about that civics, uh, the two civics production queues. Again, there's only really one in that if I choose to build a miner with my civics production, I don't have global civics production anymore. It's not going to my global pool. Instead, all my civics production here is being used to build this miner. The miner will improve this mine, um, which then in the mine itself, because it has ore, will give me two extra base training to the city, which will improve my training production queue. So there's a trade-off here, essentially, between investing your civics into building specialists, um, which then potentially can improve the outputs of your city, such as uh, making your mine more effective. But at the same time, you're not building anything with your training queue, and that training isn't being used to build units. Instead, it's going into your global training pool. One more thing to note about specialists, you can only build specialists if you have a citizen. So you'll see here it says cost citizen. Once this miner is built, that city won't have any citizens left because it only had one. You remember that one in the green box. If I cancel this miner, that one comes back. I see the one here as well. So choose your specialists wisely because you are limited with how many you can build based on the number of citizens. Lastly, you can also build projects with civics. There are two types of projects, repeatable projects and fixed projects. So the treasury is a permanent uh, project that you can build. It will give you 100 gold when it's done, and then 10 gold a year. It's essentially like a building that's inside the city. You can think of it that way. Then there's repeatable projects like festivals and for Greeks, Olympiads, as well as council. You can think of these as things the city does, like holding a festival, for example, uh, or hosting the, an Olympiad. Um, 
that give you a benefit, but you can, when they complete, and then a permanent benefit as well. Here, for example, a festival gives you plus 20 growth to a city and minus 20 discontent, as well as giving a festival that gives one culture a year, and that will stack for every festival that you complete. Um, and that 20 growth goes directly into that citizens pile. So if you, if you need more citizens for more specialists, you can uh, build festivals. And all projects uh, take civics. They use your civics production queue. Uh, and that means growth will now overflow into your um, into your citizens pool for that city, and training will go to the training production, the global training pool as well. Let's go ahead and build that miner on that ore. All right, I've zoomed ahead and built that miner. You'll see there's now a specialist here. The city has one fewer citizen, and now this golden box has a one in it. And then if I hover over it, it tells me that I have a specialist. You can also see the specialists on the map here. That miner makes it so that this mine that previously gave me two training now gives me four training in total. And I can see that in the breakdown of how my training works here or here. Uh, I've got eight base training for the city, one from the miner, one again from the miner because of the mine, and then two from the mine. So now I have 12 base training and I can build warriors a little faster than I could before. Before it took me six turns to build a warrior because I only had 10 training production, but now I can build a warrior in five turns because I have 12 training production. So special resources can help improve your city's production queues. For example, we have a pasture here that is on some cattle and that gives this city an additional two base growth. If we hover over this tooltip here, we'll see that we have eight base growth, two from being connected since it's the capital and is always connected to itself, and then two growth from that pasture. That, that's where that two growth is coming from. Uh, marble, so likewise, similar to pastures, gives base civic production. So we see we have two base civic, sorry, eight base civics, two from being a sage's family. That's a big benefit that the sage's family has, two base civics, and then two from that quarry. And ore that I'm hovering over here is primarily going to be used to improve your city's training. You see here we've got uh, eight base, two from the mine, and then two from uh, the mine, which has ore specifically, and two from the miner on that ore mine. Uh, uh, just a mine without ore won't give you training, but a miner on a mine without ore will because the specialist gives you base training as well. You'll note also that I have a marble here that I haven't built a quarry on. Uh, that marble is actually giving me one stone without an improvement, whereas the quarry where I built that uh, improvement on that marble is giving me 10 stone. So I'm only getting one tenth of the value of that resource, so I probably will want to build a quarry there as soon as I can. Um, resources without an improvement generally will give you very, very little, so you'll want to build improvements on the most important resources uh, depending on what you need. Uh, if you need stone, and you're probably going to need stone because everything in this game needs stone, you'll want to build those quarries, especially on marble, uh, as well as somewhere else. I went ahead and started that quarry, as well as started a festival here, because I want to build another specialist here to show off one more thing. All right, this city finished the festival, and that gave it 20 growth, which was just enough to get a citizen here. So now I can build a stone cutter here. You'll notice it's a little hard to see, but the borders expand once that specialist builds. You can see when I hover over that specialist, basically the specialist will expand the city's border. So I'll get that sheep in the city's borders as well once the specialist completes. So here I've zoomed ahead, that specialist has completed, and now I've gotten that uh, sheep into borders. And again, I'll notice that that sheep is giving me just one food as a resource and no growth. Uh, but if I build a pasture on it, I will get two growth and 10 food. Um, which is very valuable. Um, and now, since that specialist completed that stone, core, stone cutter on the quarry, uh, is giving me an additional two civics production that I wouldn't have as well. Um, for four in total, two base from the quarry, and then two additional from the specialist. And you'll note there is this little beaker icon that's plus two science. So each specialist gives you plus two city science. You can see the city science breakdown here, um, as well as uh, basically every city gets one base science. Sages get two base science just for every family. Every sage's city gets two science. 
and then plus two for each rural specialist. Urban specialists, which are upgradable, um, can go plus two, plus three, plus four for apprentice, master, and elder. And then the sages have a trait uh, as their family seat of plus 25% city science. You'll note there's also this bar down here, and this other bar that I haven't explained. This is the culture bar for a city. Uh -huh. City's culture is displayed right here. It goes from weak to developing to strong to legendary. Um, and essentially once this bar fills up, the city will increase the culture level. And then there's this discontent bar that explains essentially um, how unhappy the city is. And you can see that the city is going up plus six discontent a year. Um, so in four years, it will reach another discontent level. And it's worth noting that discontent reduces growth, science, and increases maintenance for the city. Uh, so once the city ticks up in the four years, we'll see that growth and city science are reduced as well as increasing maintenance. Uh, this city is making me 24 gold, but it's costing 14.4 from maintenance. Most of that is coming from population. The cost for actually improvements, it takes about two gold per improvement. Uh, and then some cost reductions for being connected and with a family that has pleased. You go ahead and build a warrior out of this city and then move ahead. So the city picked over to developing culture here. Uh, and you'll see a developing culture event. And I have two choices essentially this event. There's a bunch of different random events that you get each time a city goes up in culture to developing or strong or legendary. Um, and I could potentially get one additional citizen directly to this city. Uh, or I could get six orders and gain a scout unit. Just for illustration, I'm going to take a citizen. And you see, essentially, I get a free citizen in that city. Um, didn't have to wait for the growth bar to fill up. It doesn't actually increase the growth bar. It still takes 110 uh, growth to produce that next citizen. I still get, it still costs 110 to produce the next citizen. Uh, but now I have a citizen for free, uh, which means I can get a third specialist in that city, should I so desire. So the city has now just gone up a discontent level, and you can see at level one discontent, I have a reduction of minus 5% growth, minus 5% city science, and plus 5% maintenance. Um, so my science that was a little higher is now down to six for that city. Maintenance costs have increased a little bit to 20.4. Uh, you can see there it's plus 5%. Uh, and growth has decreased as well. You see uh, it's now minus 5%. Uh, growth. So instead of plus 14, I have plus 13.3. So it's going to be slower and slower to build growth-based units in the city. Most notably, discontent does not impact training or civics. So your cities um, will be able to produce at the same level for training and civics as they can as discontent goes up, but will get less and less efficient for growth and science, and also maintenance costs will go up. Uh, so that generally means you'll want to focus on growth with your city's early game uh, because it's very, very efficient, uh, especially if you can get a couple growth resources up and running like uh, cattle or especially for hunter families, camps or fish or uh, farms. Those are all really great for increasing growth. Um, and then later on, once you get more specialists on board, uh, as well as getting training up and running, you can have that city focus on either uh, training or civics or both. Generally, you want to focus on one or the other. So I might take a city and build a bunch of barracks and put some specialists in it and really focus on training and have that be a military production capital. Or I'll build um, some courthouses or have quarries up and running and really try to focus on civics production. Um, you can do both, but of course, everything in this game is a trade-off. There's limits to what you can do, and you can't do everything because you only have so many turns and so many orders to do things in. So it's usually wise to specialize your cities uh, one way or another. You can, of course, also specialize your city towards growth, um, although you probably don't need that many cities that are focused on growth, especially since the cost for a set settler and worker goes up per city. So every settler you make and every worker you make within a city makes any subsequent settler worker more expensive, but uh, that doesn't apply to new cities. Those cities have their own uh, cost increases, so it's usually good to start off with a worker um, in another in a freshly founded city, unless for some reason you are in dire need of a military unit right there and then. Um, I want to keep this a short video. So to recap, you've learned in this video about growth, training, and civics. We've also very briefly touched on culture, discontent, money, and maintenance. Um, as well as science, but the, the core thrust of the video has been on growth, training,
training and civics, the three production queues that every city has and how uh, it's used to produce things in the city, either growth-based units like scouts or settlers or workers or caravans or dis disciples or military units like warriors and slingers and archers and chariots or civics like specialists like that miner that we saw or the stone cutter for the quarry or projects like a treasury or uh, a decree or an inquiry or a festival or a council. Anything that isn't produced in those cities goes into the overflow uh, for growth. That overflow is citizens that you'll need to build specialists with, um, since you need a citizen to convert into a specialist. For training, that goes into the global training pool that you can use for force march, for promotions, um, and for hold court if you have a judge leader, as well as many other things. And then civics, which goes into the global civics pool, which is useful for hurrying production, um, which we haven't covered in this video, but is, is a significant piece of what you can do in cities as well, uh, as well as uh, assigning laws and uh, various missions and things of that regard. Lastly, Old World is a super complex game. It's really incredibly well designed. Everything interlocks in a really satisfying way. That makes it pretty hard to teach and hard to learn in that because everything is related to everything else, uh, I can't really explain just a couple things very easily. I've tried here, but obviously I've just hinted at a bunch of other things that I haven't talked about in this video that are all related to these mechanics. Um, if you haven't already, I highly recommend taking a look at the manual. It's really well written. It's about 130 pages long in a PDF, uh, but it's pretty awesome. And I the game really clicked for me when I first read the manual, and I still highly recommend it. Um, it does a great job of giving you a, a tour of all the interlocking components. And you can find the manual from the main menu of the game by clicking Extras and then clicking Manual, and it will open up in a browser tab. That's all for this video. If you have questions or comments or suggestions, please post them in the comments below. And if there's other topics that you'd like to see covered, let me know. I'm happy to uh, try to tackle another part of this delightfully complex and interlocking uh, game. Really well designed, really fun to play, and I'm hopeful more folks will start enjoying Old World soon. Take care.